Hey guys, EST here back with episode two of my ongoing series that's somewhat popular so far. I'm getting some good thumbs up, so if you like it, leave a like on the video. We're talking about proper misconceptions, but it's not just, oh, you think this, but you're wrong. It's actually this. It's more like uh, blind spots, things that you didn't know that you didn't know. Slight corrections, but then I'm also going to hit on outright myths. So the first thing is uh, haircuts. Yeah, haircuts. Total blind spot for most people. And you know what? I'm just going to keep throwing this under the bus. The Walking Dead. It's TV. It, they're telling a story. It's more about the characters and what's happening than like building a full simulation. Even in that one, they went pretty hard on the hair, like the, the teeth to an extent. But, you know, also Hollywood actors like to look good. So, of course, you're like, well, I'm an adult. I'm not stupid. I don't watch Lord of the Rings and start thinking, oh, man, I better protect myself from, you know, orcs. Like most people above the age of like eight know the difference between reality and, and not. But in the back of your mind, kind of unconsciously learning things is you observe something that appears to be real people doing real things. And you don't know to think about things deeper. And one of those things is haircuts. And I also said, you know, health, dental, clothing, you know, that kind of stuff, skin quality. If it was really a grid down kind of thing, like a full economic collapse, you know, societal collapse, people are going to look awful. Okay. Their hair is going to be a mess. And like hair being in your eyes and being, you know, very unclean, smelly, that kind of stuff. It's not good for you. Um, your clothing is way worse because you can naturally stop washing your hair and it kind of regulates itself with like oils and stuff. And actually like head lice, they really like clean hair. They, they actually don't like dirty hair. Oh, trust me, the number of, like, little mini myths and mini misconceptions in this video are gonna be nutty. Hey, if you find it useful and like it, leave a like on it. And perhaps subscribe for more, I'll just throw it out there. So, a, a lot of people will say, well, I'll just grab my knife and I'll chop my bangs out of my eyes and there you go. But, um, I remember hearing, distinctly, a statement made by someone who was, like, trapped on a deserted island for, like, three months or something, or uh, it was a boat or raft, I don't remember. And they said, yeah, I, I thought about it deep and hard. I'm like, there's nobody here. But I, I, it was just so contrary to like human instinct to just say, I'm going to do a total hack job on my hair. Oh, well, don't care what, you know, my hair looks like, like, cause you know, with no mirror and just like a knife and do it a blind, you're going to look awful. But even with nobody around, you're, you're going to sit there and hesitate and think, oh, I don't know. I, I, oh, I don't know. Cause everybody's used to making their face and head look just right. So, um, you could look up how to do basic hair and maintenance and like self haircutting and just, you know, not make it look horrible and be a complete disaster in probably about 10 or 15 minutes on YouTube. Now I wouldn't say, okay, now I'm qualified to go do haircuts. It's just, eh, you know, you could do something basically passable and get like the basics of haircutting theory pretty quickly. And you probably should. So that's the first one. I went kind of in depth on that, but the rest I'm going to kind of breeze through unless additional details are needed. But if you're like, whoa, you got to do a deeper dive on, on this. This is fascinating and I want to learn more. One, there's probably other videos out there on the internet. Most informational videos on YouTube just aren't very good, unfortunately. But my channel is and I'd certainly ha be happy to make it. So leave a comment. I'll either answer any further questions you got or uh, make a full video on a topic that uh, sparks your interest. So leave that down in the comment section if you want. But uh, number two, I, I hate it when people say, because it's partially true and it's partially not. If it's not directly going to save my life or, or keep me alive, I'm not interested. It's not going in my pack. Okay, mini myth. I only need one bug out bag and it has to be light enough to carry. I bet a lot of you just thought, yeah, what's wrong with that? Well, I have a bug out bag. It's about eh, 10 pounds maybe. It's a backpack. It's just got fire starting water, I think like maybe a kilogram of rice a knife and I didn't even put a tarp in. That's the like five second grab it and go. I hang it by the door, you know, bug out bag. But you may have seen my bug out bag video on this or my other channel. Actually, I put one there just because I thought it was funny. That is like a three foot duffel bag that weighs like 30 pounds. That is like everything. That's like, I'm going to go live in the woods for six months, that bag. And it's still not a lot of comfort items, but a lot of stuff in there. A lot of people would say, well, you don't need this. So like myth number one, you only need one bug out bag. I think I've only ever heard uh, J.J. Johnson uh, from Reality Survival and Eric from Rule the Wasteland ever say, I've got the true bug out bag, but then why not? I made another supply bag where if I've got, you know, if I've got 10 seconds, I'm grabbing this one. And if I've got five minutes, I'm grabbing the other one because otherwise you got to frantically pack, which is stupid. Like I can't even imagine. It would take me 30 minutes to look through all my gear and stuff in my basement, run up and down, find a... A, a something to carry it in like a cardboard box throw that in the car on a bike or something i have one bag ready to go i've got a, a huge food bag full of like 
oh, like 14 days worth of food and water and that kind of stuff. And then I've got the extended it would be nice bag. Why not have all three? But then also don't downplay or ignore the mental stuff because you can have all the food and water and safety and health and security in the world to keep you alive. But then as soon as that's all set, you're going to sit there in your homemade shelter and say, yeah, I did it. I'm, this is working. Oh, it's so great. And then just sit there for five seconds and I'm bored. What do I do now? Oh, sit here and do nothing and take a nap or like worry about my family and everyone else. And, um, yeah, this sucks. I'm bored. There's nothing to do. Life has no purpose and I'm only living to live and keeping myself alive to keep myself alive. And that is crushing. People generally need to socialize. They need a purpose. I mean, go watch that reality show. I think it's still even going on. It's like 10 plus years or something of it. It's called Alone. Yeah, they like leave people out there in the wilderness and they try to survive longer than everybody else, but they don't know how many people dropped out. Wonderful show. But besides the long-term nutritional things, which that's a huge, huge, huge thing, people are just like the the psychology of it. A lot of people who consider themselves very tough, very like antisocial or just, oh, I don't need other people. I'm not a clingy, you know, I have to go out every Friday and hang with my friends or I don't feel right kind of people. Even they're like, okay, it feels like it's been a year because time passes slower when there's nothing productive to do other than the same repetitive tasks like food and water. You just get to thinking like, what about my family? How are they doing? What if I miss somebody dying? What if I, I, I miss birthdays? I missed, I haven't seen this person in a while and... What if they die soon? What about my grandparents? You know, how much time do they have left? And could I be back home helping someone? What, you know, is our our relationships going to be the same when I get back? It's just like, that's more relevant to that show specifically, but I'm just giving examples of like, all I'm saying, because I've said it before, is you need something to occupy your mind. I don't care if it's a 10 watt solar panel and your last three smartphones or some smartphone with a cracked screen you got for 10 bucks at the pawn shop. And then threw a $15, 128 gig SD card in it, which I'm not kidding. That's pretty much what it is. And you loaded it up with 500 hours of movies and music. Oh, and uh, prepper PDFs and guides and yeah, you probably should do that. I already made a video on it. But just some, some music people are like, oh, I don't need a solar panel, this extra one pound of stuff and a cell phone. What's a cell phone going to do for survival? Well, it's going to keep you sane. It's going to give you something to do to occupy your mind. I've had people actually say, and it's usually the macho, like, douchey, gun tuber survival, I'm better than you, you need more training, martial arts enthusiast, idiot channels out there. And there's, they're a dime a dozen. And they attract similar people in the comment section. I really can't stand those toxic communities. But they're usually the ones saying, oh, what, you, you put a crossword or a Sudoku book or whatever or a, a novel in your backpack and your go bag. Oh, what, are you going to read it? What, 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 what are you going to eat the pages? You, you better crumple it up and light it on fire because that's all the use you get to get out of it. You don't need a book. You just need to tough it out like me because I'm tougher than you and you're not tough enough. If you haven't had the displeasure of coming across those types on YouTube, when you do, run far, far, far away from them. Everything sounds great until you think a little tiny bit deeper about it. And then realize they're actually the weakest, most egotistical, like I care what other people think about me, fragile people. That's why they're like that. Total attention seeking, you know, look at my muscles, look at how skillful I am, look at how much better I am than you type people. Those are the type where if they're alone in the woods for a week, they would lose it. But in a stressful situation where you don't know anything about what's going on, anybody could kill you at any point or whatever, there's roving bands of criminals or... Just who knows and you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you're feeling sick and you don't know what it is and you can't go to the doctor. All of that, you need to take your mind off of it and just escape for a little bit as long as your you know, food, shelter, safety, security, and, and all the fire and all that stuff is set. So having something to occupy your mind that, that's not useless, that's not, oh, you're weak, it's nobody, nobody, no matter how tough they think they are, can just go live out in the woods alone. Now, the, the other thing is you really can't go live out in the woods alone at any point. Let's say total societal collapse, you're going to want a group of people. Just because you got to sleep sometime, you need to assign tasks. What if you twist your ankle? What if you fracture a toe and you're off it for, you know, two weeks? You got to have that backup, okay? And people to watch your back, it's just solo doesn't work. It's almost impossible. Even survivalists are like, I've gone out in the woods for a week or 30 day challenge. And like by the end of it, I'm like, I would, with, you know, 20 years of training, ex military, this and that, I would hate to do this. For another 30 days. They've even said, I don't think I could do this for another 30 days. And these are like experts. Like they teach classes. They have like master's degrees in like woodsman stuff. These are former special ops people. And they're just like, I'm losing weight. This is awful. And I want to go home. But usually they're solo or it's like duos, you know? And like, I'm even referencing some people who won the show alone. 
the winners of the show who have done it were like, I would never want to do that willingly again. It was the hardest thing ever. So, Mr. Oh, I, I got all the training. I'm going to go live out in the woods for a year. No, you're not. No, you're not. Now, another myth that that leads into uh, that I also had on my list here is, oh, well, I'll just hunt. No, you won't. There's not much to this one. Yeah, you could trap all the rabbits and, and shoot them and this and that and squirrels and whatever, but so is everybody else. People are crafty. You could take some inner city, I don't even own a car, I don't even know how plants grow type of person. And they'll still, from watching a movie or watching something on like the Discovery Channel 15 years ago, will be like, well, I know how to slingshot a, a rabbit. Oh, well, if I do this, this, or this, this would work. When it comes right down to it, people get, I mean, just think about what people do to innovate and build stuff and get stuff done in prisons with like nothing. The tools, the cooking methods, the, you know, secret electronics and like brewing alcoholic beverages in a toilet. And look, even the most like uneducated, like you wouldn't think survival people when it comes right down to it and they've got time and... Yeah, so th what I'm just going to say about this, because it's kind of self-evident that I don't need to elaborate too much on it, is during the Great Depression when people were just out of food and they were starving, and this also has happened in every major war zone where supply lines break down or governments collapse and the people and the farming goes out, the hunting laws, I, I don't care if the government still exists. Oh no, I might get a fine from the DNR. I guess I'll let my family starve. Yeah, no. And if you're thinking, well, I heard that theory that like, as soon as, you know, everything collapses, if it does, everything's going to be hunted to extinction. But I don't know if it's really true because, you know, some, I live in the city, I don't own a car and I don't know where the Starbucks is made except in, in the back of the Starbucks, you know, that type of person with zero training and they're, you know, they don't know like how trees work. Guess what? If they get hungry enough or desperate enough, they're going to figure out how to catch a rabbit and turn it into a tasty meal. Okay. It's not that hard, but hey, during the Great Depression and during, you know, war zone, governmental collapses, it, it, like we're talking different continents, universally across the board, people, if they can't steal stuff, because that's where they resort to first. Like, I'm not going to go catch a rabbit because I, I missed a paycheck because I got fired and I have no money to buy food. I'm just going to sell something or steal something. Okay. It just is what it is. That, that's what goes to most people's minds. By I, I don't mean I, I probably would go catch a rabbit. But if you get like supply chain meltdowns, like, you know. 2017 Cuba, even, and I just want to say before COVID, you go in the grocery store, the line's out the door, and then you get in there and there's 87 cans of garbanzo beans because you can grow them and not much else, you know? It's not like, oh, here's, you know, nine different imported cheeses. No, not in Cuba. So that's embargoes, but it could be, oh, shipping issues and supply chains due to lack of staffing, due to COVID, due to whatever. Like, whatever it is, if there's a breakdown of supply chains and now there's not even stuff to go steal, ooh, <laughs> you know, it, it's like... Me and my family are going to starve. I got to do something. It doesn't matter whether somebody thought they were a criminal or not. Now they are. But after that, it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'll just, there's rabbits hopping around all over my neighborhood. Fine. I'll just go, you know, do something about it. People could, could build a bow. I mean, a slingshot, like it's still kind of high skill, but it's not that hard to figure out how to snare something. And if the internet still works, you'll hop on your phone and do it or go to the library and use it for free. Like this is anywhere in between like, oh, 2008 housing crisis, now I'm unemployed and I'm desperate and I'm homeless to like full blown, you know, absolute collapse. There's different levels of like, well, I'm going to do something about it. But usually like one of the last resorts is hunting. So around those times, anytime that this has happened in history, all of a sudden the local wildlife numbers plummet to near zero. There were, I think, some species that went extinct during the Great Depression because people hunted them illegally. And if you think the DNR doesn't have enough people to catch all the illegal poaching and people shooting does and hunting out of season right now, try multiplying the number of like, we'll just say poachers by like a thousand, 10,000, hundred thousand. Yeah, you ain't hunting for anything after about a month, okay? If it was like nuclear war or like, I don't know, some pandemic that kills 40% of people and just the economy collapses because there's just no workers to do anything. Yeah, everything is getting hunted to near extinction or extinction within weeks. It just is how it is. Especially the people who are trained and go hunting before or no fishing or whatever. There's going to be no fish. There's going to be no nothing. So I'll just go hunting. No, you won't. Now, speaking of theft, um, a lot of people are like, well, I, I'm good in case of a collapse because I'll just grow a garden. Oh, I'm good in case of, you know, massive grid down, whatever, this and that, you know, shortages on fuel and now everything's still going, but but there's rolling brownouts or like week-long power outages where I live, but I'm good. I've got solar. I've got a generator. I've got this. I've got that. A garden is almost useless unless you're so far away from society and, and then nobody knows where you are and there's no like utilities, roads, or power lines going to your place. Because otherwise, you want to find a house to raid, follow the power lines. Follow every road, you know? 
Find a database on a hard drive. Heck, find a paper phone book. See, a, a garden? 3 a.m., somebody sneaks in, you're sleeping. What are you going to do? And let's, let's just say we hit, like, 2008 housing crisis levels of unemployment and everybody's job's getting disrupted, but doubled. Like, twice as bad. So not quite like Great Depression, but we're getting there where people are desperate. They're losing their houses. You got all these like loan problems, uh, programs of the government trying to do something. Or we'll talk like Hurricane Katrina times too, or like the coronavirus and the shipping shortages because of lockdowns and food production plants being shut down due to COVID infection, but like times two. You know, something where it's like, it, it, we've seen it before recently, but it gets really bad. Where people do resort to, well, you know what, to supplement, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to eat too much meat. Beef is completely off the table, literally and figuratively. Maybe we'll have chicken once in a while. Otherwise, it's all rice and beans and what other, like, really poorer countries do to just get by. You know, we're eating potatoes, we're eating rice. Okay, it is what it is. But, like, you know, let's say your food budget had to triple because food prices triple. And then everybody's, you know, like I said, losing their houses because they can't make the mortgage payments because, like, we'll say 15% unemployment or something. But the government, the police, everything, they're still there. They're overloaded, but they're still operating. You know, that that level of situation, if you're like, oh, well, that's fine. I'll just, I'll just you know... One meal a day will be entirely from my garden. You could do that in like a very small yard with good sunlight. You actually could. I mean, we're talking 1,000 square feet, 100 feet by 100 feet even. You you could almost feed yourself for an entire year if you liked, you know, repetition and grew the right stuff. Which, FYI, a little super short version of my other video, um, like zucchini, cucumbers, garlic chives, onions. I grow them. I love them. Everything I said has about enough calories to feed you for five minutes. I think an entire cucumber, like, it'll make you feel full, but it's got about, I think, 30 calories in it if it's, like, a foot long. A potato? Now we're talking. Potatoes, corn, beans, and I guess beets, but they're disgusting. I can't think of another thing that has enough calories. I made a whole video breaking down the top, you know, vegetables by calorie and that kind of stuff. Check that out on my channel. But the short version is, one of the things I just said, grow that or don't bother. So that's, that's like, the mini myth about, oh, I'll just grow a garden. Well, I, if you grow carrots... There's not much sugar in carrots. There's some, but it's, you can't live on carrots. That's why people eat carrots when they're uh, losing weight, just saying. I guess you could grow wheat, too, but that's hard to process. But uh, let's say you've got, you know, 15 rows of potatoes. You took up, you know, 250 square feet in your background or your backyard. Boom, That that's you're saving 200 bucks a month on food by doing just that. Until desperate people know that you've got a big old garden because they can see it. Um, I mean, if you fully protect it with a fence and it's in your backyard and it's behind your house, nobody can see it walking past or driving past and you don't talk about it. Doesn't mean your neighbors won't talk about it. Your neighbors might sneak over at 3 a.m. and steal, you know, three potatoes and you'll never know what did it. They, they could make it look like an animal. I mean, pe when people get desperate and food is involved, all bets are off. But like I said, your Great Depression people grew gardens. They resorted to theft. They resorted to legal hunting. But was it complete and utter anarchy collapse of, of everything and society didn't keep on going? No, people went to work. People, you know, rich people still kept on doing rich people stuff. There were still cars on the streets. It's just the, the worst off people and quite a lot of people were like actually starving while society went on around them. You got to prepare for something like that. And if you've got a garden and people see it and they're like, wow, look at all that corn. Kind of hard to, you know, hide 10 foot stalks of corn. They're going to just come up and take one when you're not looking, not home or not awake. Okay. It's that simple. If you think you can secure a garden to the point where nobody can break in, like what, what are you going to do? Build a prison cell around it? Like, you, you almost can't reasonably secure a garden unless it's on your roof. And even then it's not like somebody's going to walk on foot with a ladder and put it up at 3am silently and go get it. But I could also just be walking past looking for stuff to break into, break it into cars or who I can mug to steal some resources, money, whatever. And think, hey, look at all that food growing up on a you know, second floor balcony or a roof or whatever. Give me your foot. Give me a boost. There you go. When people are out of food, they are going to steal. They're going to do anything. That walk 10 miles down an abandoned highway. If it's that or die, the overwhelming majority of people will not just give up. They will do anything to get food. And if you're advertising, oh, look, plants with food, people are going to steal your plants with food. So saying, oh, I'll just garden. I'll just farm. Well, you better have a hell of a security system, triple arms, all that kind of stuff. I don't care if it's tin cans on fishing line or really loud bells or, or like electric lines that run on solar. Anything in between, you know, LED lights on solars and battery backup with, you know, guns at the ready or, or guard towers. I don't care what you do. All depends on the, the situation, but the whole like, all just garden and then all of a sudden one night your entire harvest goes missing. Well, now nah, I guess you're not gardening then this year, are you? 
because someone took it. So yeah, same with solar panels. I believe I touched on that earlier. If you've got to make sure you can pull them in at night or something, the permanent installs, people will climb up there and just unbolt them and, and just silent hand tools and take them. If they want their cell phone to work and they got to go and they see those, they're taking them. Now, another thing, a lot of people say, yeah, okay, I get it. I would do better than the average person. And I'm pretty prepared for a complete and utter societal collapse. Just anarchy, every man for himself, 90% population dead, you know, starving and just all, all that nastiness. Yeah, that would suck, but it's more realistic to just think, oh, extreme hardship, extreme economic, you know, whatever, but people are trying to hold it together. Even something like a little bit worse than the Great Depression, because that was purely financial. But also, I mean, going back even further, remember, uh, like, the potato blight in Ireland. People starved because of that. But did the country of Ireland collapse just because people were starving and dying? No. The really, like, adept people, the really I'm-gonna-try-hard people, existing rich people, people with durable businesses, they kept going. They could import food. They could do whatever. It was the poor people. It was the peasant class. It was like the, like anybody with disabilities or like orphans. Uh, I mean, back then, and even to this day, it's usually true. The most vulnerable people are the most affected by this kind of stuff. While even 50%, 90%, 10% of society keeps on, you know, just keeps on ticking, keeps on doing their daily stuff and just, oh, I'll have less money. I'll have less resources. Oh, I'll, I'll get around it. But yeah, I mean, just think about it. It was like, what, a 50% overall like calorie drop? crop failure but i don't know if people have even have hard numbers on that but like they needed potatoes to live and then a fungal thing came in and killed the potatoes there's plenty of videos about the potato blight i mean people just left i just look at what people do when when a, a supply chain and food collapses it gets nuts there's so many examples of this now fast forward to modern society i think if you're here watching this video you're not like well it would never happen again because we're so far past that if anything it's more likely to happen in 2022 onward because of the, the number of dumb, you know, tech, service, useless, I don't grow food kind of jobs. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not th saying, oh, we all need to go back to, like, the Amish. I'm just saying, like, identify that society is more fragile. Plus, we got a higher population and things move further and the supply lines are weaker. There are some things that have improved. There are some things that haven't. Look, d d moving anything with horses was stupid, inefficient, dangerous, and got to get people killed in case stuff got hard. But also, the population densities of cities now compared to then... Cars are better than horses. Cities are worse off than they are now. Apartment buildings are worse than, you know, Western towns in 1840. There's pros, there's cons. Okay, great. But a lot of people get it in the back of their head that, well, oh, it, it's fine if this happens, that happens, whatever, because I'm just going to lean on the insurance company because I, I don't think, like, like, like I always say, Hurricane Katrina, this is literally where this idea came from. Or Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane freaking anything, any, any big one. The first thing Allstate did, one of the major insurance companies in America, was try to get out of paying everyone and then ask the government for money because they're like, okay, we, we can't just go from like, we have a 10, 20, 30% profit margin after operating expenses and cash on hand from people paying premiums, but now the number of claims went up 10x. Like if you take in a billion dollars a year, you can't pay out $5 billion. It, like you, you can't pay money you don't have. So when people say, well, in case of a fire, in case of a tornado, in case of whatever, if it totally levels my house, I'll just lean on, you know, the insurance company, my house isn't insured, I have really good insurance, we'll just rebuild it and that's fine. So I'm not, I'm not really planning for that. I mean, yeah, okay, if it was the worst possible scenario, okay, I'll make it work, I'll do my best, but it, the other, you know, 95% of the probability here is that it'll just be a localized thing. Even like an earthquake, well, okay, I'll just I'll, I'll just worry about insurance and they'll they'll rebuild me a house, they'll relocate me, they'll pay for the hotel. I think insurance companies have tried to snake their way out of or exempt um, earthquakes, for sure flooding, um, historically wildfires in California and Australia. Any major hurricane, they've tried to get out of that. Insurance is not a magic wand and insurance companies are not magical money generators, okay? They will usually get bailouts, because if they don't do it, the government's going to come with a benefits program and have to, like, do some basic thing with housing or FEMA or relocation anyway. But let's say there was a hurricane slightly bigger than Hurricane Andrew while simultaneously having an earthquake in California. A very widespread one that just destroys, like, a trillion dollars worth of property. I think the estimates are actually in the two to three trillion. Remember that not only is your insurance company sure as hell not paying for that, they would go bankrupt overnight, but also... The government only takes in, I think, like $8 trillion in taxes. So if the event is like, it's not society ending, but it's really bad, don't count on the government or insurance to rebuild it for you. 
remember we learned during the pandemic war is great depression everything everything i keep referencing endlessly but they're really good examples so i'm gonna keep doing it everything we learned from that is sometimes the disaster is somewhat regional it affects a lot of, large amount of people and it's a, a it seems like it's society ending but really in the rest of the country a different region the rest of the world world keeps spinning Society keeps going. People keep going to work. People are still outside walking their dogs. You're, you're failing to feed your family, but you go look you know, down the street and people are still driving. They're still in the in the Wendy's drive-thru. Middle class, upper middle class, rich people, they're fine. They're, they're doing great. They're, you know, the budgets are bad and whatever. And some of them that are overextended are getting their houses foreclosed on and that kind of stuff. But like in case of a really bad economic or, or just money draining event, even like an environmental, you know, natural disaster or something similar... It's bad, it's expensive, it's going to make entire segments and businesses collapse and unemployment can skyrocket to the double digits, but you might get caught, it might, I mean, it's almost the most likely outcome, where the government and insurance companies do not have your back and cannot help you more than the basics, but at the same time, entire other groups of people are still doing fine. It's not full-blown walking dead, 95% of people are gone, you know, there's a million people left in America, or whatever, and people are just running around, there's no law, there's no nothing. You're probably going to get caught in the middle where it's like, you know, and that's when people go hunt deer illegally and that kind of stuff and start, you know, massive theft. And then, then you know, maybe you get a security job if you're clever enough, just saying, because the rich people are going to need you to guard their stuff. So if you're the first in line to volunteer and be proactive, suddenly you've got a high paying crucial job where they need you a lot. Just saying in situations like that, historically going back, even like 1000, 2000 years, they would just pay you in food. Yeah. You look back at history. Yeah. It's. It's some weird scenarios. I mean, the joke all through 2020 and 2021 was, wow, this is the worst end of the world ever because I still have to go to work. I'm just broke and can't afford food. And a lot of people more seriously were like, I, I did not see, oh crap, I need PPE. I need this, I need that. And it's purely economic, but also I can't legally leave my house or they'll haul me off to the COVID camps in Australia. People just did not see that coming because they, they watched too many Hollywood movies, which, okay, they're based on reality. They're based on historic events. They're based on, you know, real scenarios, real stuff, real projections by highly paid PhDs who study this stuff. But it's still a bit of a trope, you know? It's not realistic to every scenario that could happen. Sometimes it is purely economic. Sometimes it isn't pure anarchy in the entire country and everyone collapsing and running around with AK-47s. Sometimes it is, but almost usually it isn't. And that's the number one myth. So people who are saying, well, I got this, this, and this in case of a short-term thing, in case of a, oh, there, there's a peaceful protest in my area and I got to get out for a week. Oh, my house got burned down, but I'm fine. Yeah, probably if it's just your one city, they probably will come in and assuming you don't have a protest slash rioting clause that exempts your house and then it, you got to pay out of pocket. Check that. Yeah, the government, nonprofits, donations, friends, family, even maybe insurance companies, they might have your back in that case, but if it's any bigger, they don't. So moving on past that, that kind of group of all different things, let's talk suppressors, aka silencers, if you look at the uh, initial patent. It's an inaccurate name, which is why people said suppressors, because uh, really just the myth with these, and I'm sure an overwhelming majority of you have already heard this, but if you haven't, they do not make a gun silent. But also it's a myth when people say they don't make a gun silent. <laughs> The, oh, the Hollywood movie, pew, 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 that, that's a complete myth. No, it isn't. Subsonic 22. You can get a gun down to where an average person would not e at least be able to identify it as a, gunshot, uh, as a gunshot or hear it at all within 500 feet. You can get that quiet with Subsonic 22, which could, like, take the head off a rabbit. Not great at taking down a human or a deer, just saying. I'm not saying it can't, it just can't do it reliably. Almost any other caliber. I have heard subsonic 9mm. You can shoot it without ear protection, but boy, a mile around, people are going to be like, well, that sounds like a gunshot. That sounds like an explosion. That sounds, sounds like a, a big loud thing. So silencers, in double quotes, um, no, they're not like ultra mega stealth uh, uh, hunting. Would I want a 22 over, let's say, a crossbow or a bow? Absolutely. But I don't know, I mean, a crossbow and 50 bolts, they're not called arrows, they're called bolts, really, really good, like, carbon-reinforced, crazy, not-gonna-bend kind of stuff with multiple replacement tips. Boy, you could do a lot of hunting with that. You gotta get closer, the, the kill rate isn't quite as high, you could probably take the head off a rabbit at 100 yards with the right kind of 22. but you're gonna run out of ammo eventually, and who the heck has the money and time to get a suppressor these days, at least in America, just saying. So it's like... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not saying completely get rid of firearms because they're not going to be quiet enough, but if you think, oh, I'll just hunt, first of all, reference earlier in the video, 
But even if you're just like, well, I'm going to do that briefly or I'm going to get far enough away or whatever your plan is. Have you ever heard hunting season? It sounds like a war in some of those places. I've actually had where, where I was like, hey, how far away do you think that is? And so we actually watched for the flash. And based on the, the, the flash that we saw, because it was kind of, you know, getting dark out a little bit versus the sound, they were kind of up on a hill because Wisconsin has a lot of hills. They were about two and a half miles away. And it was like, turn your head instantly. That was definitely a gunshot level of, of noise. You could take about 10 to 15 to 20 decibels right around there, depending upon the gun and the caliber off of that. So it might go from like 130 decibels down to like 110, which is still ear splitting and loud as crap. You are going to hear that for miles around to give away your position. So silencers aren't magic, but also a 22 subsonic specifically, which is usually a 40 grain uh, bullet with a little bit less powder, just saying. They don't break the sound barrier, so they don't have like that whip crack, you know, uh, what do they call it? Sonic boom, which a suppressor does absolutely nothing to stop, just saying. So if you don't have that sonic boom, but there's still like, you know, what, 30,000 PSI or whatever of, of air coming out of the, the barrel because, duh, gunpowder explosion. If you can take that shockwave, cool it off and stop it with like the interior little baffles and a silencer... You can get 22 pretty dang quiet. You can get almost anything pretty darn quiet if it already is subsonic. But like try even finding subsonic 223 or 556 for your AR-15, let alone an AR-15 class and, and caliber of suppressor. The ammo in the suppressor, probably double to triple to quadruple the cost of your gun. So most people don't bother with that and it's really not that quiet anyway. It's somewhat quiet, but it's still a gun. So that's like both sides of the silencer myths. Um, also, I guess 22 lethality. I got so many comments about that in my uh, other video. People are like, you know, like the Navy SEALs used to use it defensively. They would just hit people at the right spot of the head. Yeah, well, they have like a thousand hours of training. And they got $2,000 guns that they sighted in the day before they left to their combat mission. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to go on a limb and say that doesn't apply to most people. So th both myths are actually out there. 22 is amazing and it absolutely can kill anything. You could kill a deer if you hit it in the head. Yeah, maybe. Human beings have died from a 22 gunshot. I mean, and you, you and you could hit them, you know, 15 times. Boy, good luck surviving that. I mean, I've got 1670 FPS stinger ammo. Boy, I wouldn't want to get hit by that. I think they're hollows too. You can get that stuff zinging. Oh yeah. So the, there's there's a myth that 22 can't kill anything, and there's the the myth that oh, with shot placement, 22 is fine and can kill anything. First of all, I don't care what you say. It's not going to kill a crocodile or wild boar, okay? So, no, it's not magic. But then also, it's not um, like, oh, you might as well be firing a BB gun. It's not going to get through a leather jacket. There have been stories of leather jackets stopping 22s. There have been stories of people getting shot with a 22 and dying, okay? Th there's both. So, it's somewhere in the middle, but I will say, the FBI collected public statistics from some time in the past, said that I think it was 41% lethality... For any human being who had been shot one time, not multiple, only one time with a nine millimeter. Now those numbers are going to be all over the place and go way up and way down. If you account for like, did they get shot in the lungs, the head, the heart, the leg, the arm, the finger, the hand, you get shot in the hand, you're surviving. Okay. You might die from an infection. That's about it. You're probably not going to bleed out. Just saying you get shot even with a 22 through the lungs and it collapses. You could die. You get shot with anything in the head, you could die. But I've seen people actually take a, a pretty high caliber pistol bullet to the head and live. So there's no for sure, but also you can't take one little outlier and say, well, the other 99 cases don't matter because I found one counterexample. I hate it when people do that on the internet. It's so stupid, so uninformed. But yeah, it was 41% single gunshot 9mm. And remember, emergency services, cell phones. You know why the number of murders have been going down every year for the last 20 years pretty much? It's because the number of gun assaults and crime has actually been fluctuating or going up or whatever, but people don't have to jog to a payphone to dial 911. So the ambulance gets there 10 minutes sooner. We got the E911, the GPS lock. We got the Apple Watch calling saying, hey, did you fall? So no, gun crime isn't going down. Assaults and attempted murder aren't going down, but the number of murders are going down because of infrastructure. So those statistics, how many people died because they got shot once with a nine millimeter, 41%. Now pretend the, the ambulance ain't coming. I, I can't even give you a number. I don't know, 80, 90%? I don't know. Even with shot placement. 
you can get all these like like these wound issues and like oh you don't die but you die six months or months uh, hours later or, like two days later like old timey civil war kind of stuff where oh I took a ball to the arm but it's fine we put a tourniquet on it cool um, and and I'm healing and then you die because of something else like a like a blood clot or whatever like without medical you get shot once you are probably and I mean that literally like higher than fifty percent probability probably dying. So the lethality of a single 22, I believe, was 11%. One in 10 shot, and that, that almost comes down entirely to shot placement, I'll just tell you that, just by guessing. You get shot anywhere non-vital with a 22, you're probably living. That, that's pretty much what, what 11% says to me. But now imagine there's no hospitals and there's no ambulances. There's no, there's no medics and there's no field surgeons. Now I actually wonder what the lethality of a 22 would be. Here's the problem, though. When you're in a gunfight, you're usually not really caring unless you're, like, committing an assassination or a murder, which you shouldn't be. You're not that concerned with, in the end, in a month, in a week, in a day, in an hour, are they going to die? You're, you want stopping power. You want hydrostatic shockwaves. You want big wound cavities. It's just like when they say, like, knife fights, it, it's going to be who bleeds out first. It's not the first person to get stabbed. It's the first person to run out of blood. That's why the, like the saying, nobody wins in a knife fight, it's because probably, unless you block every single blow, or, or you only get sliced once and you got them ten times, they're going to get some on you, you're going to get some on them, and you're both going to bleed out, you idiots. So, like, the, the, the wisdom is, don't get in a knife fight. Thus, nobody wins in a knife fight because eventually you're both going to lose. So, if you hit someone with a twenty two because they ambushed you and tried to steal all your tasty canned goods, do you care that... Eight hours later, they're going to die. That three days later, they could die from complications because of one gunshot. No, you want boom, bang, they're down. Nor can you say, oh, look, they've got a little 22, a little little Ruger 1022. Oh, no. Well, if you get shot with it, don't just say, oh, well, 11% lethality. They got me in the arm. I'll be fine. No, that's that's honestly a little bit of a Hollywood movie trope again. But most people don't. They, they know enough consciously to not get any kind of firearm information from any movie. I don't think I need to give most of you a heads up about that one. So is a 22 useful uh, as defensive in general? Yes, like in a war, I guess. But is it useful in a defensive sense? In a just absolute, I'm, I'm starving and I need to ambush this person to take their stuff, this is life or death kind of situation? Not really, because the stopping power is almost non-existent. So people saying, no, a 22 is, is lethal enough. Oh, I, I don't need anything bigger than a 22 because if somebody comes on my property, I'll just shoot them in the head. First of all, probably not. That's not reasonably doable. But also, it still doesn't have any kind of stopping power. Oh, I'll just get them in the lungs. Oh, okay. And then hopefully stay undercover and hopefully they didn't bring accomplices and wait for them to bleed out or their lung to collapse 30 minutes later. You know what happens to a person when you hit him with a 308? I'm not sure I can say on YouTube, but let's just say they usually aren't even in one piece. There's there's really three sizes of, of, of calibers to me. 22, which is just not very useful in, in personal, like human versus human. Rifle calibers, because they're just mountains of energy. Just, it's, the lethality is like 80, 90, 95%. Because human beings just cannot survive that amount of things in their body being displaced and that amount of blood loss. A direct hit to anything anywhere and they're they are in trouble and then there's not rifle calibers like those are the three categories hollow point pistol uh, up close hard to aim eh. it has enough energy to kill someone but the stopping power is is is, is it as high mentally deranged people people on drugs cocaine you know painkillers yeah even a 45 even like really big pistol caliber ain't gonna stop them unless you get you know, like they said you get them in the what's what's the the polite term the, the wires in the machines or something like that, or the the, the pump and the wires, the uh, whatever. Yeah, let's just say if you hit somebody with a with a FMJ, you know, 9mm through the neck, they're probably not going to return fire. But, like, a rifle, like, there's a reason they don't fight wars with pistols. They bring them in case, look, as a backup, in case the rifle jams and somebody runs up on you, but you use rifles when you want people to go away, okay? That, that's a polite way to put it. And also just an overriding thing in case you think I'm going to like a weird place with this and just I'm, I'm already there mentally where it's like, I'm going to have to kill people. You cannot survive every gunfight. This is not a Hollywood movie. You are not the main character. You do not have plot armor and this is not a video game. The number one way to survive a gunfight, people say training, accuracy, good equipment, body armor, tactics. Yeah, okay, cool, great. But no, you're missing the number one. Don't get into the gunfight in the first place because you can't win every gunfight. 
I don't care if you go to the range every day for five years and think I'm basically Billy the Kid at this point. I, I could take anybody in a gunfight. Well, no, not 100% of the time. And even if it was 1% of gunfights or gun battles or whatever that aren't just blind ambushes, which that can happen, throwing that out there. If it's a real like, oh, look, somebody covered the woods attacking my group of six people to take what we got. And there's three of them. But we're so much better, we're going to win every fight and nobody in my team's getting shot. Uh, probably not, no matter how good you think you are or factually are. There's other factors. There's weather, there's timing, there's gun jams, there's you could trip and fall, there's you could get snuck up on, get flanked, get... whatever. Bullets travel faster than the sound of the bullet, okay? You can't win every gunfight. So avoid every gunfight possible. Speaking of that, we're getting into the next one. Boy, I'm segueing these hard. A lot of people say, I could just trade or barter. I, I've got this, and I've got, you know, I've got nothing but, you know, this, but I could trade it for other stuff I actually need. If things are so collapsed and so bad that people aren't interested in money anymore, every single bartering operation, I don't care if it's your cousin, if it's a stranger, if it's somebody who walked up, if it's somebody you met on the road, every single trade, every single bartering uh, opportunity is a time when you might get robbed, shot, stabbed, whatever. Even people with good intentions could go into it and say, oh, opportunistically, you know what? Uh, this trade, it's kind of, it's what I need, but just one little boom and I could keep my stuff and have all of their stuff. Hmm. An impulsive person who's desperate, who thinks that, yeah, I'll trade. Let's be moral. Let's be civil about this. For quite a lot of people, it's still going to run through their mind. So do not barter or trade any items with any person unless your life is in danger. My gosh, do I hate that myth. I'll just trade for the rest. No, don't. You will get shot. You you do it 10 times, you could get robbed five. You could get robbed once. You could get shot once. Any single time it can and may go bad. You know why? Because people are desperate, and usually the people still alive after three months after a big collapse are the ones with guns and smarts and training and good vision and healthy and young and... Yeah, I mean, especially video games, especially RPG players, especially Fallout players, you're used to just, oh yeah, people just kind of, they, they like to go back to normal and play normal. Yeah, great, until they're desperate. And if they're trading, they're desperate. So I'm not talking about like, oh, we're all outcast pirates going around the Caribbean and robbing ships. But it's cool because we could all go into Tortuga and trade with each other. Yeah, probably. You could get supplies and all that, but still, first of all, people still got robbed there. And secondly, anybody could have jumped off one of those ships and rejoined society. It's not like when you become a pirate, you have to like tattoo the word pirate on your forehead. People had an out. They had an option. That's why they weren't like, I need this to go off. I need all the resources and I need me, 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 me. Otherwise I could die. I could run all these supplies in a week, a month, a year. So I need to take it. I need to rip this person off. The only thing stopping even somewhat moral people, let alone immoral people from just taking what they need because they have the power and because they have the opportunity because they can is risk of consequences, societal pressure, and like fear of consequences, like one being shot or two going to jail. And then like, even what would people think of them? Like even I, you know, everybody it's run through everybody's mind. What if I did rob a bank? I think I'd be pretty good at it. Who hasn't thought about that for like a minute. And then usually it's, eh, it's not worth the risk. I probably wouldn't get away with it. Ah, cameras, DNA. Eh. Yeah. What would my family think? I'm not a criminal. I'm an upstanding person with a mediocre job. You know, like, well, now imagine there is no society, everyone's for themselves, and, and you don't have a grocery store to go to. Well, now, really, you think you're going to barter with people, and they're just, oh, because it's the right thing to do, I'm going to be square on this. I'm not going to use sleight of hand pickpocketing or just shoot you in the face to take what you got, because that would just be a bad thing to do. Starving to death is a bad thing to do, too, okay? I'm just saying. So anytime you barter or trade with anyone... It is an opportunity for them to follow you back, to spy on them, or you to get robbed, get shot, get ambushed en route, get ambushed on the way back. The distance you have to travel away from wherever you're, you're staying or if you're moving around or whatever, like it's just, there's almost no scenario where this would work unless society is still kind of being rebuilt. And even that, where people are just like, well, I like this because I'm relying on other people. I just do my job. And then they do the farming and I do this and I do the scavenging and it, it works. So I don't want to rock the boat, you know, that, then it's like, yeah, okay, bartering, I get it. But that's like somewhere between 10 years later and never, or like five or I don't know, like look at the walking dead. That actually is a fairly accurate example from most people's estimations of like, yeah, okay. They could make trades. They could make agreements. They could have trade agreements, that kind of stuff. Like even like the new, you know, the 13 colonies back in the day in America, they would trade with each other, trade with England. And that was like, people were starving. It was really like, we just showed up with not nothing, but not enough supplies. 
things are bad. There's not enough housing. There's not enough this, that. There's not enough medical supplies. Everything was super tight and like on the verge of collapsing because it's just, it is what it was. And yet people still had supply lines and trade lines. I mean, even going back to like the Silk Road and like the East India Company, even when things were really, really rough, like the medieval times, even they still had trades. I mean, even people traded with like Rome and stuff. Like when you have some semblance of a society and some semblance of law and order, at least just like, don't be a jerk societal pressure. Bartering did work, but in a full collapse where you're just like, well, if I need this, I'll trade a water filter for it. If I need this, I'll trade ammo for it. If I need this, I'll trade some of my dry goods for fresh meat. No, you get it yourself. Somebody you trust from your group, like all you pitch in and maybe kind of just informally trade, but it's, you're all sharing because whatever. You don't go up to random strangers you, you just met on the street and say, let's make a trade. Okay, that is, that is the last thing you should ever do. You cannot trust anyone. So I hear so many people say, I'll just trade for it. And any prepper who knows their stuff immediately corrects that and says, no, 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 you won't. Don't do it. Here's why. That's why I wanted to really focus on that when I dropped the most number of um, examples, because some people still will hear this and say, no, no, no. Most people are, are, are usually good. It's the bad people that'll all die off and the good people will be the ones who survive. It'll be us preppers and, oh, well, this person's like me. They're a woodsman. I wouldn't shoot them. Maybe, but like not 100% of the time. It would be so dangerous to interact with strangers and let them know that you have supplies and just all this like security information. Just no, 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 no. Don't do it unless you are literally, you you need like antibiotics to die or something and somebody has one. Or to not die, I should say, not to die. Um, Another one, I think I might have mentioned this in the last one, but I didn't keep the notes. I deleted them after I made the video and now I'm thinking that was stupid, so I'll just kind of touch on it. Water filters are not magic. I'm going to have a video coming up about this, but it's like really taking a lot of writing and research. A lot of people are like, I got my life straw. I got my Sawyer. It's all set. Okay, well, what if there was a flood and people had liquid pesticides and gasoline leak into the water? Guess what? Particulate and even like 10 micron filters are not going to filter out dissolved atomic compounds and tiny mo molecules. If there is effectively weird chemicals slash poison mixed in with the water almost nothing is going to filter that out. i think reverse osmosis and uh, distillation that's about it i'll just make sure it's moving and it's safe i'll just make sure that i boil it and it's safe i'll just run it through a filter and it's safe wrong during not just the big hurricanes during any hurricane they will get the warning do not drink the water and also don't drink the water that's filtered you got to have pre-packaged sealed um, like bottled water or big jugs, one gallon, half gallon, five gallon, whatever you got, because everything that got washed away out of everyone's garages, holy crap, you got WD-40, paint, fertilizer, pesticides, industrial lubricants, like you just can't really filter every little bit of that out. Particulates, you know, minerals, heavy metals. Yeah, you can get a filter good enough for that. But for like the other stuff, dissolved solvents or whatever, whatever they call it. No, and like double no if there's just been a disaster and the groundwater or the water supply or the water in the pipes is disrupted and contaminated with random stuff from destroyed cities. People got a lot of weird chemicals around the house and in the garages. Just saying. Farms, businesses, chemical plants. Don't even get me started. So no, water filters aren't magic and you don't have, like, why would I carry around water or have water bottled up or have water stored? I've just got water purification tablets. I've got a filter. I'm set. No, you are not. Another one. Okay, what is the number one threat? The number one thing that is going to very, very harshly ruin your chances of a survival if you're out in the woods. Like, we're talking, you're not in an abandoned building. You're not in your house. You're not... I guess not in the desert. I don't want to give too many hints here, but like you're, you're on a mountainside, you're in the woods, you're in, you're in a marsh, you're in a plains, you're in Alaska. You're effectively out in the wilderness, rainforest or a, a whatever, pine forest, a fairly normal livable area. What is the number one thing after you've secured water and food and all that, that is going to affect your survival? If you're very competitive and are going to try to guess it, pause it because I'm about to say it. There is a darn good reason that in my, like, tier two bigger bug out bag, I've got a mosquito net. Mosquitoes have killed more human beings in human history than anything else, other than old age. Mosquitoes have killed more people than any disease, any war, any black plague, anything. Now, I get it. It's indirect. It's the, it's the stuff carried from mosquitoes. But also, I'm not saying, well, the killer mosquitoes are going to murder you with Lyme disease or what, or wait. No, that's ticks. What, malaria. That's not even in my area. 
It's just the fact that, like, you won't be able to go anywhere or do anything without getting swarmed. Like, I, I don't know if it's different where you live, but every overnight challenge, one week challenge, oh, camping survival challenge, I don't care if they're in the Caribbean or if they're in Alaska or anywhere in between, if it's not winter, there are mosquitoes. There are mosquitoes everywhere in the world, except deserts. They don't tend to be where there's not water. But I have been places in Wisconsin where I'm like, where the heck is there a source of water within even five miles? Well, guess what? It rains, there's puddles, there's larvae, there's mosquitoes. It, it's, they will show up anywhere. And constantly getting bitten, if you get bitten enough times, you'll actually start to develop like a, a mild like, you know, allergic reaction, a fever for lack of a better term. You'll have all the bumps, you'll be itching, constantly itching, not able to do your job, not wanting to walk around. Then you can only walk around in the heat of the day when they're not as bad or not out, but then evening when you should be walking around and not getting dehydrated. Oh, well, now you're getting swarmed by mosquitoes. Oh, okay, I'll just build a shelter. Well, is it airtight? Did you put screen windows and screen doors on your shelter? You won't be able to sleep unless you can fully cover everything but, like, your face in, like, a, 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 a sleeping bag, and then it, well, sleeping bag, it better be 60 degrees to colder Fahrenheit, or you're going to be sweating to the point where you die of dehydration. Mosquitoes are going to be... I'd say roughly equivalent to every 10 minutes I will walk up to you while you're trying to survive in the forest and kick you in the balls. That is approximately how much of a psychological slash disruptive thing mosquitoes will be. So here's what you do about mosquitoes. Nothing. There is no solution. There has never been a durable solution that I've ever seen. I honestly don't even understand how human beings survived before insect repellent. I don't get it. I know they just wore long sleeves, heavy clothes. If you get bit enough times, you stop having a reaction and stop itching. But that takes a while and not everybody gets there. But they're just so, so annoying. Even just like flies in Africa or just like ugh, any rainforest area, you get mosquitoes like crazy. It's so bad. Some people just like left. I don't understand like what the Aztec Empire or the Mayans or something did about mosquitoes. I don't get it. I, I assume just continuously farmed and burned a plant that drove them away like, like uh, citronella or something. I don't know. I kind of tried to research it and I just came up with nothing. I know smoke drives them away, but it'll be so much that you won't be able to breathe. Like, it's not like, you know, one little whiff of smoke and like every deer within 10 miles is gone because they, they know to avoid, you know, smoke and like forest fires and stuff. So bigger animals are that smart. Mosquitoes. Yeah, they don't love smoke. I mean, when I go cut the lawn in the middle of spring in my neighborhood, which has just got some trees, but it's mostly kind of pretty urban and suburban, really. You know, a campfire with a bunch of green crap thrown on it, it, it does a little bit. Usually I got to get those citronella coils and burn like one of them on each corner of my lot, which is not very big. Even then it doesn't keep them away completely. I still have to wear like, you know, th like sweatpants and a freaking, you know, long sleeve jacket in the middle of July. And that's with chemical assistance plus, you know, spray. Like just mosquitoes are like the worst thing ever. And the, the, what you can do to prepare for them is nothing. So like I said, to, to circle back, there is a darn good reason that I have such the big, bulky, heavy mosquito net in my emergency bag. Because mosquitoes are an emergency. Like I said, if you can't sleep, you're going to die. If you can't walk around, you're going to die. If you have an ongoing uh, histamine reaction everywhere on your skin, you're going to feel really bad and might die. And if you totally psychologically collapse in the point where you just can't possibly do it anymore because of nonstop tormenting by mosquitoes day and night and get four hours of sleep and you're constantly breathing in smoke and your lungs are on fire and even that's not keeping them away, the sheer nonstop no way out mental torture of mosquitoes is going to be the number one thing that might just do you in in the forest or anything that even resembles a forest unless it's what winter, fall or early spring. At least that's, you know, where I live, where we actually get seasons. I think if you get to, like, a high enough elevo elevation, there's not mosquitoes, but it's, it, like, I think there's mosquitoes in Denver. Let's just say you'd have to get up pretty high. If the mosquitoes can't breathe, you probably can't either. If you think, well, I'll just go north and stay away from the mosquitoes and just keep, like, during the summer, I'll go north where it's cold. Well, that's going to make it pretty dang hard to farm or garden anything or hunt anything because everything's hibernating or not jumping around or not reproducing. I mean, it's not like you see... 10,000 bunnies running around in the middle of, of winter. Y you do, but it's not as many as spring and summer. And you can't really forage for stuff because it all died off. So if you're just like, oh, I'll just live in perpetual winter and keep going north every time the mosquitoes start hatching, that's not the most effective thing. But, like, mosquitoes are that much of an issue. It's just everybody's blind spot. Nobody wants to talk about it because there is no solution. So I even asked around on live streams and comment sections, just Googling if anybody had, like, a solution for this. 
Nobody has an ongoing persistent solution that works everywhere in the world. And very few people had a solution that works anywhere in the world, period. It's just extreme cold, extreme hot, the rest of the time throw on a jacket and stay indoors and uh, it, there's, there's just not much you can do. I mean, obviously avoid standing water, don't live near a lake, you know, that kind of stuff, but... Yeah, if you want to live somewhere with almost no water to the point where there's no mosquitoes, guess what? You need water, too, and there's not enough to go around. So it's, you can't get away from them. They live where you do, and mosquitoes are going to be the worst thing ever. I, I, I am actually all for any kind of little long-shot scientific experiment, like genetically mutated, whatever, mosquito releasing, and they're working on lasers that can shoot them out of the air. I don't care what it takes. We need something better than, oh, here's a bottle of something that runs out after three days. Because that, that's not a solution to me. That's not durable. I need something actually durable. So I would say, oh, well, then add um, citronella to your garden. But I think citronella oil from an actual plant or like a different component of it actually is highly carcinogenic. Um, if you like extract the oil or just like the, the repellent part of the citronella and just have it citronella scented or citronella extract, that doesn't cause cancer, but citronella plants when burned do or something like that. So I can't even say, oh, just get some citronella seeds, grow it, and then burn it or whatever. Because it either doesn't work or it does work and you don't want it to work because it'll kill you too. <laughs> if any of you have a solution for mosquitoes other than just wear long clothes and keep swatting at them and be pissed off all day, I would love to hear it. I mean, I know even like some old tribes in like Brazil and stuff, they were like, we would just smear mud on our face and still get stung constantly but at least it was slightly less annoying i mean if you can wherever you live whatever country whatever area just look up historic and up to date and anything in between mosquito mitigation and just like prepare for that because otherwise everybody thinks they're they're like oh i've got all this i got this, i got fire starting i've got water i'm fine and they go out in the woods are like oh these bugs are awful oh crap i ran out of you know bug repellent or didn't bring it in the first place because Duh, that stuff stores horribly. I mean, cans of bug spray, they usually rust, they're pressurized, they're dangerous, they're flammable, they expire. And like I said, they run out pretty dang quick. So yeah, not not, not going to work in a long-term scenario. So you have to do something about mosquitoes. It's almost just don't live in the woods, don't build a shelter, find an abandoned building and live there. If it's that bad that it, it collapsed and after, you know, what I hate to say it, three to six months... X percent of society is going to die just due to lack of food because right now the farms are what are feeding people. If everybody starts a garden and everybody kills one deer, that's still not enough to go around. If society collapses, two thirds to 90 percent of people are going to die within a couple months. That just is a fact. So just mentally prepare for that, physically prepare for that because that's just reality. But I would say after that point, if you're all hiding out in a rural area in the woods, hunting, setting up a shelter, all that, you're all set. Get back to a place where I, as long as mold and you know, a, a dangerously collapsing structure or roof isn't going to kill you. Hide out in a building and just seal it up. Plastic, duct tape, screen, harvest screens off of people's windows. I don't care what you got to do. You, you're just going to have to get a mosquito-proof shelter. It just is what it is. Everybody who watches, you know, stupid, like, fake Discovery Channel crap with, like, Bear grills, on up to, like, oh, some random YouTuber with 100K subs went out in the woods for a week and showed how he lived, like, actually off the grid with nothing but some batteries and, and a camera and a knife. Because that usually is real. I, I, that, that, that's real crap right there. They all make it look like, you know, it's, it's entertainment, it's education, here's how you do this, here's how I did this. Usually the whole time in the background they got a second bag full of bug spray because that's just one of the things there is nothing they can do about. Like, look at this shelter, I slept in it for this amount of time. Like, even that, that uh, I think he's Russian or whatever, Polish guy, where he, like, goes out in the woods and does all the cool woodworking stuff, he tends to go out at a time of year when the mosquitoes aren't out there. Also, his house is mosquito-proof. But if you can get into a shelter that's that's pretty protected or you can seal up pretty, like, almost airtight, instead of just open air, total free-for-all, first of all, the mosquitoes are still going to smell your breath and detect the carbon dioxide and monoxide or whatever else you breathe out, so there you go. And your heartbeat and your thermal and all that, but okay. They can't just, you know, I'm not just standing out in a field getting bit, okay. You can just blast the crap out of the area every single morning and every single night with smoke and get a little bit of repellent there. But everybody giving you the impression, oh, I only need to protect from rain? No, you, you, not even just mosquitoes, it could be any insect. And the best survival areas are near lakes, so even just like swarms of lake flies, those are annoying. But things that are persistently annoying and don't go away are going to be like a psychological like torture to you. So mosquitoes are more dangerous because they land on you, they bite you, they cause actual problems and carry diseases. But it's, it's just human beings really need to live in an area that's like can be bug proofed. 
So once again, anybody who says, you got a mosquito net in there, that thing weighs like four pounds. It's huge. It's like a foot by six inches by six inches. You're an idiot. That's a waste of space in your backpack. What, are you going to eat it? Oh, I'm so sick of YouTubers like that. I really am. They're just so clueless. Yes, mosquitoes on the priority list are roughly equal to food and water. I don't care what you say. If you think differently, you're wrong. Period. The end. So the last thing in my notes are, um, oh, I'm good because I've got a little bit extra gas. Or like I said on my channel, I always leave my car with half a tank minimum so that no matter what, at any time, I could just get in the car and drive 150 to 200 miles or more. Well, in case of a really widespread anything, roads, highways, county roads, county highways, anything vaguely major is going to be absolute standstill because... One, two, three, four vehicles out of 10,000 break down in the lane or somebody hits somebody or just purely a capacity thing where you you, you can't fit 30,000 cars down this place. You can only fit 15,000, but there's 30. It, it's just physics. It's just like one person hits their brakes for one second and three miles back, a thousand people are stopped. The road system and the highway system is designed for just barely daily use levels. And not much over it. They do not say, well, we only need two lanes here or three lanes. Let's build six. Because highways are so insanely expensive. Cement, concrete, asphalt, blacktop, all that stuff. Insanely expensive. Labor, relocation, workers' comp, the equipment, the fuel to move the materials. It is so, so expensive. They barely stay ahead of demand. And that's why your city and your highways and everything are constantly under construction. So... If everybody's trying to go one place or get out or whatever above the normal amount, you are getting nowhere on anything that even resembles a major road. And even like, I, I've tried to get out of my own neighborhood through a side street during Oktoberfest or like a big outdoor, you know, event. Like they did a, a winter ice carving thing. Heck, I had to go north instead of south to get where I was going because there was a farmer's market going on, let alone like some, some outdoor concerts some conventions. And, like, I certainly don't live in a big city, but I certainly live in, like, kind of a suburb. I mean, if I drive two miles, I'm at a farm and a bunch of empty fields. So, like, you know, welcome to Wisconsin. But, like, I don't live in the middle of Milwaukee. You know what I mean? So, like, even in my area when I can't get down a, a 30 mile an hour major city street because, oh, an extra 5,000 people went to one thing. I, you ever seen people trying to evacuate for a wildfire? They ain't going nowhere. That's why the military comes in and gets it going. If somebody stops, they, they got helicopters, they got planes, they got satellites, and they're like, let's drag this off the road, give the person a ride, and keep waving traffic through. You know, there ain't going to be that if everything collapses or there's a major disaster or war breaks out or whatever. Asteroid hits, out, whatever. So the whole, don't worry, I'll, I'll always have my car. It's electric, I've got solar. Oh, I've, I, I've got diesel. I can make biodiesel. I've got a 50-gallon drum of gasoline, which, my God, is that a bad idea? Even people say, well, I'll be able to get out when other people can't, and I'll be able to drive when other people can't because I've got 20 gallons of fuel sitting there, which can fill up my car once. Okay, yeah, but only if the roads are open. What about the other people who just filled up yesterday and have a full tank? They're jamming up all the roads. So here's the thing. Okay, this is why they say, like, I'm, I'm not going to say just in case of emergency, always, always, always buy a car with high ground clearance and off-roading tires. No, that's like a waste of like $20,000 plus gas mileage plus everything plus insurance. No. Not everyone needs to drive a giant truck and try and park that every day and be a headache to themselves every day. If it's relevant and you need to haul a boat and you got the money, okay, go for it, cool. But like my car, I'd be lucky to drive that off a curb without to totaling it, you know? It's got the ground clearance of like a tricycle. It's not a lowered car, but I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not even rolling on, what, what are they, 15s, I think? They're very expensive, you know, all-terrain, all-weather all ones, okay? I probably could drive through a field, but that's about it. I mean, my radiator would light the field on fire as I drive through it. Let alone my exhaust, okay? This isn't even like a, a basic cheap F-150 or something, you know? So, it's a consideration, but I say, you know, don't buy a car for something distant that might happen. A car is a pretty big purchase. That's like, I'm going to move out to the city and drive 30 minutes into work every day, waste all my money on fuel, depreciation, car expenses, my time, at a, you know, what, an hour and a half commute every day, just in case... Just so I can live out there, just in case. I don't even have an interest in living in a rural area, but just in case. I'm on garbage internet on a cell phone tower, just in case. But I'm not going to live in a small city or on the edge of a small city because what if? Well, live your life, my God. And I would think that that kind of extends to 
car purchases because that's that's still like you use it every day it is such a huge decision in your life and i've had my car for over 10 years so don't take this as me saying you have to buy a lifted off-roading truck or you're crazy like any sedan is a death trap and you're dead in it but that said just if you have access to it right off the bat i would just drive next to the road okay if there's a ditch a shoulder a service road a whole bunch of slightly mowed lawns that's what you're driving through. Now, here's the thing. In almost any vehicle, except for like some garbage little Yaris or a Prius or something, anything vaguely reasonable and not like a stupid luxury car or like a minivan, well, even that, I don't know, I've seen some stuff. We'll just say something as capable as a golf cart aboard because golf carts can drive on grass, so that's what they do. So anything like that, you could probably take it down like next to a railroad track. Cause they keep that like manicured. They come through, they trim the branches, they like cut the lawn or kill it. They put down gravel, whatever they got to do to keep everything, especially wood, trees, vines, anything off the tracks. They do it and they maintain it. So if you have to get out in an emergency, follow some tracks. Also the tracks tend to just go straight shot, straight line, you know, none of this North South. Oh, nice little highway grid. Oh, nice little County roads that are square with each other. It's like, what's the shortest point between these two that doesn't crash into a mountain? And even then they usually go through the dang mountain. It's, it's railroad because they got to slow down for curves and why make it longer than they have to. If you got to go from one city to another or a port to another or a hub to a distribution center, you're going straight shot, which is usually like through the woods, through the hills, through the whatever. And they just make it work and they did it for you. So railroads are right next to them, I should say, because you probably can't drive on the railroad. That is your secret magic get out of town ticket right there. So luckily I live right near a railroad and I know that if I follow it for about half a mile, I'm in the woods. But yeah, I, I'm very familiar with where they go. And I think my vehicle even could follow along that because it would be right around like me driving through a really like poorly kept person's lawn, you know, like usually the highest thing you get around them is one foot weeds and stuff, you know, I think they do something to the soil or something to keep because they sure aren't out there cutting the grass, you know what I mean? But let's just say you're not like driving through the forest and you're going to hit like a log or a tree that fell over. Like that's, you know, you're not going off-roading in, in anything. I don't care what vehicle it is through the forest. Another one, as I mentioned earlier, shout out to Colorado Biker for actually giving me this idea in a live chat on someone else's channel, ironically enough. Power lines. The high voltage power lines, they, they will once again run them point to point. What is the shortest distance between, you know, the, the power plant and the city or the next, you know, substation or whatever? And they don't want trees falling on power lines, so they shave them, or they shave them, good lord. They come through and they, they trim them. They get the big branches out of the way, they knock them out. They, like, if you've ever seen power lines through, like, a, a forested area that has, like, you know, a couple spotty cities, we'll just say Upper Michigan, it, it's like they just took, like, a 100-foot-wide steamroller and just killed everything. They'll go through a forest, they'll go up hills, it doesn't matter, but, like, you can drive through that kind of stuff pretty easily because... You know, they do come through and cut it and they do make sure it's, you know, just kind of reasonable, whatever generic weeds and whatever grows in my area. But they cut a path through the forest that is a straight line. It goes to society. It goes to rural areas. Everybody's got power these days unless they live way out in the middle of nowhere. So power lines and railroad tracks, that's how you get out of your city in case anything happens. Now, the other thing, I will throw this out there because I mentioned it in another video. Just be the first one. Don't wait to react. Don't say, don't normalcy bias. Well, this can't be happening. It can't be as bad. It's not really coming. It's, it didn't really happen. It can't be as bad as they're saying. If you hear, hey, this just, ha war just broke out. There was an airstrike on, you know, the city 20 miles from me. There's a wildfire coming. There's, I don't know, like, there's a hurricane, but I live one state in from Florida. And it's about to get here. Well, it can't be that bad. Oh, it's not going to be as bad as they say. Like, look at, like, entire cities are underwater and it's coming directly for me. And they said it's not going to lose any of its power. Hmm. If you wait until it starts raining and you're like, oh, I guess it really is here. And they weren't kidding. Yeah. Like, if you lived in a pretty big city, but like an outskirt and the city just got hit by a meteorite. And you're like, oh crap, the power is out. That's where the, like, it, it destroyed the power plant. So that they'll have to rebuild the power plant. I literally cannot live where I am probably, or at least need to get out for a week or a month or forever. Don't wait until the evacuation order comes. Don't wait like until the uh, invading army gets to your area, the wildfire, the hurricane, the storm, the uh, robot army, zombies, uh, whatever. Doesn't matter what it is. Don't wait until you can see it to say, oh, it is really happening. That, that's like extended normalcy bias. 
it, it normally see bias. The best way I can explain it is at, at like a mass shooting. Some people will be like, oh, person with a gun, I see them and run. But if they just usually hear it, a lot of times like medium sized crowds will just freeze. Like, oh, I've been on this planet for 30,000 days and every single day I go out in public and nobody is shooting at anybody. So logically, even what I'm seeing and hearing with my own eyes, it must, I, I must be wrong. It's a natural tendency of the brain. It's not like some personality defect that 10% of people have. It's like everybody does this. But it doesn't work if you're aware of it, if you can override it. And also social pressures, I really heavily mentioned this in another video. So go watch that one if, if you want um, to hear more about this. Especially if this is all new to you, but nobody wants to be the first one to react. Because if you're the first person to go running and then it tur turns out you were wrong and you were mistaken, you're going to look like an idiot and people will be like, oh, look at that drama queen overreacting. What an idiot. It's just like when people stand around, they're like, well, the fire alarm's not really going off. It, mu it must just be a drill or somebody tripped it or it's a mistake or somebody was smoking by it. Like, I've been in buildings every day in my life and they don't light on fire. And compounding with that, like every single uh, time I've ever heard a fire alarm, it was a drill or a mistake. So I've got a hundred counter examples. So even if people hear it and, and you hear the staff saying, okay, we got to go outside because we don't know. Everybody thinks it's not really happening. Look, if the building is on fire and you could die to smoke inhalation and burn to death, even if it's a 1% chance, let alone a 5%, let alone 10%, if you don't smell smoke, but you hear the alarm, get outside. If the zombies just took over half your city, don't wait until they get to your neighborhood. Get out of there. You want to be the first out. So like if the roads look clear, you can even go on and get like the Google traffic reports in real time because it's tracked with people's smartphones that they're all spying on them if they have Google Maps installed, which you can't remove from them. Just saying. So in other words, about 100% of the time you can get a traffic report. It'll say heavy traffic, light traffic, delays, whatever. Just pick a random spot anywhere, like literally anywhere outside your city and say, give me directions to this. And it, it, it will pop up and say, oh, there's heavy traffic. You can also just Google the, the phrase like traffic report, blah, 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 my city and probably find something. And that'll tell you if you're already too late. So it, if you're like, oh, wow, the, 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 you know, the main road, the 45 mile an hour road that goes through the middle of my city, that's, that's. It's pretty open, but, oh, what if I get up on the highway and it's whatever? But you're not even seeing heavy traffic, but there's, like, allegedly a thing happening, so you're like, I'm getting out ahead of this? At least try the highway. I'm not saying, well, kids, we're, we're going for my 25-mile-an-hour thing straight to the railroad tracks. We're going off-roading in a car that we know can't probably do that. Because EST told me to always take the railroad tracks or the, or the power line conduits. We're going through the woods. I'm so smart. And then, like, the highway wasn't even that busy. <laughs> It's a lot easier to just take the dang roads and highways unless you have a really strong evidence to, to not do so. You know, visually or ahead of time or checking or technology or logic or whatever. Everything is going to be stopped. You're going to be stuck. And if you had time to load up the car for five minutes, it might be stuff that you can't reasonably carry on your back. In fact, it should be. I'm going back to the whole, I have a bug out bag, but I also have some heavier stuff that I can throw on the car in five minutes bag, which you should have. And then you're like, well, I don't want to abandon this. And then, oh, the fire gets you. The hurricane gets you. The, I don't know. King Kong gets you, Godzilla, the aliens, the alien zombie mutant robots, the swarm of mutated uh, mosquitoes that scientists release and they mutated. Now they're attacking humans and they're the size of a baseball. And it's all EST's fault because he supported trying to make mosquitoes go extinct. It's all his fault. Oh no. <laughs> and I'm stuck in my car and the mosquitoes are about to get in. You want to avoid a scenario like that is what I'm saying. So, okay, we hit haircuts, comfort items, and, and something to occupy your brain. The garden and solar theft possibilities. Uh, insurance companies collapsing and mosquitoes being the number one-ish threat. Shelters having to be mosquito-proof. Um, silencers not being magic. Water filters not being magic. 22 calibers not being magic. A lot of not magic in this video. And uh, vehicles, uh, power lines, railroads. Oh, and the roadblocks. Don't forget, even if the... the, the um, the roads are open, but I don't know. We'll say a nuclear EMP, a natural EMP, or a Carrington event that fried a bunch of electronics. Okay, now that was enough to send society completely head spinning or tail spin, whatever. And now it's been two weeks, everybody's out of food. But you're like, well, we got to move, and now now the roads are clear. Or I'm out enough in the country, I could take a country road. Well, guess what? If, if five cars go past every hour, because everybody's moving now, if they have fuel or they have a working car... Or a bicycle or a solar car and it's, you know, or solar car, electric car that was charged on solar and they're all set to go. What are roving bands of people out in the country going to do? They're going to set up roadblocks. What does anybody do in any African country? They set up road, roadblocks. Any unstable country, heck, the Middle East, roadblocks. And then they rob you, they take your stuff, they take your vehicle, they shoot you, whatever. 
you could run into a roadblock anytime and usually they make it look natural. They're out of sight. It's just a tree across the road. It just looks like something fell. And then in any weather event, it doesn't matter if the roads are open or not, a bunch of trees are going to fall over. Okay, just saying. I had a heck of a time even making it back to my own house through my city the last time there was a tornado, and it came through at 1 o'clock in the morning. So we also couldn't see. I almost, almost drove directly into a, a power line that was down. I missed it by maybe 3 feet. By the way, have alternate battery-powered lights on your or in your car to act as additional headlights in case you need to drive through a scenario like that. I mean, you could drive real slow and get one of those $7 little flashlights I showed off on my channel that are actually, like, amazing. Plus, you know, six-pack of 18650s you stole out of a power drill. And shine that out the window and look around for whatever you want. Sweep, telescope, and all that stuff. I should have done that. My headlights were crap in that vehicle. They, they were very low-mounted and... Yeah, that could have been bad. I almost drove into a tree because it was dark, and then I almost drove into a power line. That would have been really bad. But just to get back to my house, I had to park my car and move four partial trees slash large branches, drag them out of the road. And I was not wearing the right equipment for that. Ever since then, I've been putting a pair of boots and gloves and a rain poncho in my car. So there's some more hot tips for you. But yeah, there nobody was running around. People were home. They were sleeping, or they were like, I don't know, bailing out their basement because their sun pumps out of power because we, we had no power. Now, I was in a second floor apartment at the time, so whatever. But yeah, just to get home, I had to like drag trees out of the road. And this was in like a city with a lot of infrastructure. And I saw work crews. I saw the city out there. I saw the police, fire department, everybody. But they weren't in my neighborhood. They were clearing the main roads. But I, as soon as I got off the main road, I couldn't get anywhere. And I ended up almost trapping myself. It took me about 30 minutes to get home from where I was. And uh, it was normally like a seven minute drive. Yeah, not fun. Traffic wasn't the issue. But uh, I was going to uh, my work because I owned a shop at the time, uh, to unplug everything. Because when the power turns back on, that's when it fries all of your, your printers and monitors and computers and sensitive equipment. So I drove there to unplug it all and then took a different route back, and that's when it was a total nightmare. And it was not because of traffic. It was because of environment. So just keep that in mind that the roads might not be passable. So if you're going to try to get out, but there's like there's flooding, you might find too deep of water, so that might be a thing. Trees fell over, that's a thing. If you can, put a chain, get a hook, get a winch, throw a chainsaw and whatever, a charger, some fuel into your car. Whatever you got to do, do it before you leave so that you don't have to backtrack and go get it. If you're going to try to evacuate from a really big weather event. And also, obviously, paper maps, because if, if the cell phone tower is out of power or tipped over, well... Better know your area pretty good. And I mean, like, every direction. Like, oh, this is closed, this is closed. Well, that's, I only know those two routes. Yeah, not good enough. I bought a paper atlas on Amazon for $14 of, like, my entire state. It's like 100 pages. Like, seriously, you should get one. You already know what I'm going to say. I have a video showing it off on my channel. You should just watch every video on my channel is what I'm getting to. So roads and passability, once again, that could have been the, like an entire video, but I wanted to throw this all together to just get the most information out there. Also, you guys have already said that you very slightly prefer a really super long format. Um, not much on the screen. Just listen to it podcast style stuff. So here's another podcast. This is the, the Prepper uh, Misconceptions podcast now, I guess. I should probably actually call it that. Also, I'm working on getting this on other podcast platforms. I know how to do it. I just got to know if I think I should do it. I hate to say it, but my main channel is doing terrible on YouTube and my two backup channels are doing terrible on YouTube. So this is my new one and I made it entirely to make money. It is what it is. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and guess what doesn't make much money? Podcast platforms. A lot of them, they'll let you put your podcast on it, but they don't pay you anything. They don't cut you in. Now, if I go on Spotify, I hate them as a company. But I think they pay pretty good if I remember correctly or they cut you in a certain amount of views and I absolutely would get it. So I'm looking into it. I might just throw these out there, but I right now I just literally cannot afford to throw people off of YouTube onto a place where I don't make money. I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm going to be straight with you. That's the reason. So look, if you took this video and went to a YouTube download site and downloaded it to your phone and watched it later in a movie player or ripped the MP3 off, uh, let's just say I'm not going to be offended. But right now, sending people off platform when I need to get like 10,000 subs this year to get this like really going, uh, I, I'm not going to do that. So once again, I apologize. It's just the reality, but I just started a new job and uh, it's paying enough that I might not care. So assuming I don't get fired or get too fed up with the people I work with and quit, which both are very distinct possibilities, I might just do this for the education of it and the notoriety and to help people. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be my intention, but the bills don't pay themselves, you know what I mean? So for now, hey, I would appreciate it if you like the video and subscribe and check out my other content. And watch for more in the near future because I'm really focusing on this channel. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.